Hey guys, Captain Matt here. Welcome to another edition of Tales from the Cleaning Station, brought to you by Marathon Sport Fishing. On today's adventure, I got very special guest, Mr. Art Brown with me. He's a neighborhood legend down here in Marathon. Proud to call him my friend and he wanted to go sword fishing. So as of the release of this video today, it is Art's birthday. Happy birthday, buddy. Proud to have you on board. I know you're gonna love the video. So here we go. We're heading offshore. Art and I are gonna do a little, little sword fishing, a little wahoo fishing. Didn't hook a wahoo in the morning. Did a couple hours of that. We headed offshore. First drop, boom, hit the bottom, we load a tank. Six hours later, rainstorms, extremely bizarre swordfish activity, and 14 miles in the Falcon before we got the sword on board. Absolute epic fish, she's huge, you guys are gonna love it. Also on today's episode, you're probably noticing that the captain's sporting a new hat. I'm not gonna say who, but I have a couple special guests that are going to be fishing on the falcon here in an upcoming episode so at the end of the episode i'm going to show you guys how to make a little bit of swordfish bait i got a couple baits here flies are on it in two seconds so i got two different styles of bait here three different skirts i'm going to show you guys how to whip those out what i use to make a bait and i know if you watch other videos there's like every captain does this a little different i'm going to show you how i do it and if you guys have have a way that you like to stitch up your baits or make your baits for sword fishing please let me know i'll whip one of those out as well and we'll put that on an upcoming episode so grab your life jackets and hang on and welcome aboard we are hooked up this fish right now is coming up like a freight train i can't pick the weight up with the amount of drag i got on the rod right now this thing is smoking up from the bottom it just came up 400 feet oh now she's slowing down a little Oh, still coming. This thing is smoking to the top. I've got special guest Art Brown with today. Say hi, Art. Hi, everybody. Probably Art's first time you've seen a swordfish slam a bait, but here we go. We'll keep you posted. That thing is swimming the weight up. Now, they don't freak out when they see the boat. You never know. Oh, well, it's different. Some All right, I got the camera on. Fish is out. Fish is going out there. Look at it. She's good. She might come up and jump out there, Art. You watch. Fish is coming up. Fish coming up. Look at She's going to jump out here. No, I guarantee you. She's coming up. She's going to jump. She's out in front of the boat. She is smoking on it right now. 260 to the fish. This thing is hauling the mail. 209 to the fish. Watch out here, Art. She's, she's gonna come up a couple hundred feet. Grab the reel. Okay, she broke the weight off. Okay, guys, shit's getting real on this. You can see the clip come up. I grabbed the side of the spool, the LP, to stop that clip from hitting the tip of the rod. Whatever happened there, the weight got cut off in the middle of the paracord line which is probably at least 500 pound test so i had poor art grab the wheel on the boat he wasn't prepared for it but it's like gotta grab the wheel this fish is burning around on top we just got the clip on there i did not get it off you can see the water spouts behind the boat here as we're turning the corner on the fish we didn't get the clip off somehow the fish knocked the weight off I think we had the camera going for that. The, the weight was missing, but she's back down to 550 feet now. We did a few runs around the boat at 200, and she's just working her way down. So when you're fighting your swordfish, if it's going down, there's no sense in running the motor and heating the reel up. This is the biggest reel you can get for doing this, but if I'm not able to gain on her, I'm just letting her do her thing. You gotta let the fish tire out. It's been almost an hour. Fish was just back down to 800. She's coming back up again, 636. So we will keep you tuned up. It's two hours and 10 minutes. The fish ran all the way back down to 1300 feet. She's coming up now. We're at 755. Okay, we're still hooked up. It's raining like hell. <laughs> Art, Art and I are hiding the swordfish is still at 400 feet, not, not cooperating. She's down right in that thermal line. She does not want to come out of there. Almost three hours. 
We'll keep you tuned in. Okay, here's some news. Fish is coming up again. It's raining again. I don't know if any of that's new news as far as how today's deal's been going, but that's the news. It's on the way. All right. Our pool ready. It's coming up. It's going back down. Okay, that's awesome. That's that's good job. Job. Yeah, the time. Nice job, Art. Okay, yeah. here she comes. Yep, here she comes. Come on, man. Look at, we're 100. That line way out there. Look at, she's up on top. Oh, there. yeah, she's up on top. You can't see her. Yeah, she's up on top. We're right there. That's a that's a hundred feet from the fish for the black spot coming out of the water. Come on, fish. Show yourself. The cruise ship is right here. Let a cruise ship people see it. They were out. They're paying extra for this. <laughs> oh, you see how fast she's going? Yep, nine mile an hour, man. We're trying to keep up. Okay, so we're burning around on this fish, probably running ten miles an hour, sometimes a little quicker, a little slower. This fish has been very, very bizarre. Normally when I'm working on a fish and they're kind of dogging us down and it's going your hour, two hours into the fight, I'm typically running one engine until the fish gets close to the boat. So as they start getting within 100 feet, I'll start the second engine, get prepared to do the crazy Ivan maneuver once that fish decides to either attack the boat or do some jumps or whatever. Every time this fish would get close to the boat, and we'd start the second engine and take off. So here, a few hours later, we get the fish up on the surface. And we're chasing it around. It's going around circle after circle after circle. And I can't figure out what's going on. The people on the cruise ship are got to be watching this program. I wish it was sunny so we could see it. There's a second light. Yep, the second light's about, I'd say, 10 feet from the fish. Oh, shit, there she is. Look at that. <laughs> you can see her down there, Art. I can with my glasses anyway. I can just make her out a little bit here. Okay, guys, so make a note here. This is something very important. If you look at my reel there, I'm probably running about 12 pounds of drag on this fish. Just kind of make a mental note of this and as we get a little farther in the video you're going to see how important it was that i did not crank that drag up to 15 to 20 pounds okay so if you're ever on my boat and we're sword fishing i start screaming crazy ivan you seen that rod tip right there flip 180 degrees that fish took off like a freight train she was about 40 feet from the boat flip directions she's burning the reel off right here. You can just see it spinning off. You can see the prop wash in the back. I had the boat doing about 20 knots there on that corner to make sure she didn't shoot up underneath those motors and get caught in the wheels. Right up on top right now. Those, that's her right there, those lights. Should... Okay, round and round and round we go. Where we stop, no one knows. This fish keeps cranking circles. I, I'm sitting there in my mind trying to figure out what's going on. She'll, as soon as you get the boat near her, she takes off, goes the other direction. Right here, she's starting to dive back down again. We're kind of keeping her tight. She's still running back up on top after that. Again, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I don't understand why the fish is not attacking the boat. I'm going, okay, maybe she's fall hooked. Art and I are trying to figure out what to do. Do we put the drag up? The answer is no, I'm not touching the drag. So we're watching the fish circle after circle after circle here. And you're going to see the line to start peeling off the reel now. She's going to start going back down. All right, almost five hours. We think we're making headway. We know it's going to be a trip home in the dark either way. So. All right. She's at 340 now. Yeah, you, you started. She heard you rev the engine up and she took off. So yeah, that's the way it is. I don't she know. don't like the engines. That's just no all there is to it. Every time you back up, anytime you rev her up, you back up. She has sensitive hearing. Art. Sensitive hearing, yeah. Okay, so I've cut a lot of video out on this, obviously. This has been going on about five hours right now. We probably went 
close 10 to 12 miles on the boat in a straight line, so to speak. So the boat's been doing circles around the fish the entire time. So we got the fish up pretty close to the boat here a couple minutes ago. We started the second engine again. I got Art running the wheel. We're communicating back and forth. Starts the second engine. And every time we've done it, the fish took off. And now she's dumping, man. She's going to the bottom. If you look at the counter, it's running 580 right now. This fish is going to burn out 1,300 revolutions on the reel. And I think we're in like 900 feet of water right here. So each revolution on my reel, with the amount of line I have on it, it's about 16 inches. So this fish is going down and out one direction or the other here. She's just dumping. Now, this is something I've noticed with the bigger fish I've caught. Right before they run out of gas, they do a giant power run. They go back to the bottom. They're going to hit the bottom, and they lock it up. Okay, guys, so take a look at the counter here. I'm going on two speed, but I'm zooming into it. I'm in 900 feet of water. There's 1,300 revolutions off the reel. Each revolution is 16 inches. This fish burned down to the bottom, and she's spooling out on me right here. We're in 900 feet of water. The fish is just on the bottom. This thing is going crazy, Ivan, on the bottom. If you look at the counter, we're going to hit 1,500 revolutions here. I took a tape measure. I cut it out of the film here, but I measured it a little bit ago. Each revolution was 16 inches. This thing right now is over 2,000 feet of line out in 900 feet of water, and she is hauling the mail. She's going somewhere. Yeah, Wrapped it around a post down there, and she's going, pull. Oh. That was like a milk crate. Look, we didn't hit it with the line. Some kind of crab, yeah. Yeah, it was probably an old crab trap. Okay, that fish, when she hit the bottom and just kept burning out, we're up to 257 revs now, working the fish back up. We are at the six hour mark right now. When you get to the point where you've got the fish coming towards the boat and it's tired out, communication is extremely important anytime you get within that 100 to 150 feet from the fish range. They could turn a corner and burn 100 feet in a second or so because they're huge and they're an extremely fast fish. So you can hear Art and I communicating, very important. We both know exactly what's going on. He's telling me where the fish is distance wise. It's hard to see it right now with where the sun angle is and the fact that it's getting close to sunset. Go towards the fish. You just want to cut the angle, Art. Cut okay. the angle, okay? Straighten it out. Straighten it out, yeah. 22, 22, 17. Keep talking Three. to me. 17, to it's left. two, two, two. To it's zero, left. zero. So we're getting down to where I can almost make a poon shot here. I could actually throw it. You can hear Art and I communicating back to each other. It's just before sunset, it's cloudy. It's hard to see down in the water. So we got the fish up on top. I can tell it's kind of fall hooked or something because it's coming sideways instead of straight on. So I'm just being patient until I get a you get the fish in as close as we can before I make a poon shot. Okay, so I finally get a shot with the poon here. I get the poon in the fish. I drove the tip of the poon into the gills, and then I'm gaffing the fish right here with the first gaff. We're going to gaff her with the second gaff. Art, Art and I are kind of <laughs> moving the stuff around the line so we can get it. You know, it's a very tense moment. You can see I got a gaff each direction on the fish here right now. So. We're going to take this fish and let her bleed out in the water. We do not want to put the fish into the boat while it's still alive. Keep hitting them. Not in the meat. Not in the meat. <laughs> Stay still. I'm hitting the rope and everything here. I see that. The rope's on my foot. Your foot is on your foot. We've poked the fish through the gills a few times just to get it to bleed out. You do not want to try to bring a swordfish into the boat alive. They're extremely dangerous. Dude, you see where he's hooked or hooked? No, I didn't. He's hooked in the pack fin. <laughs> well, there's the man that knows how to bring one in, hooked in the pack fin. So, hold on.
Nice fish, dude! We did it! <laughs> I can't wait to tell the wife. All right, let's get a little shot of him in the water. My luck has not ever run out. What, six hours? That's right, six hours. Six hours. Special guest, Art Sunset. Brown. Sunset. You're going to see the sunset uh, while we got this. Yeah. Oh, shit. Baby. Storm clouds. All right, time to go. Okay, here it is. The number one asked question I get about sword fishing is how do you get them in the boat? So you can see we got two gaffs on the fish on the side of the head. And you can see me grabbing this little, it's like a hay bale or meat hook here. You can slide that little hook in front of the fish's eye socket. There's a heavy bone there, and we basically got to drag them in. If we didn't have a side door, we would drag them over the side. God damn! <laughs> Holy crap! Oh, Look at the size of him! All right, back up. Unhook. Look at it, came right off. It wasn't even in. It was just wrapped around it. This is how I catch all my fish. All right, this bait's going gone, right? I'm throwing it away. There you go. Oh, that's better. Yep, there you what go. What was it? Okay, six. What did we, what did we hook at at 11? 11, 26. Six hours. It's 527. <laughs> Look at the size of that donkey. It's in the boat. That's bad. Holy. That's bad. Dude, that's a big fish. Okay, we're definitely burning daylight here, but we want to get a few photos of this fish. She was huge. It's Art's first time sword fishing, so a great, great big deal for him especially. Not to mention the captain who loved sword fishing. So we're snapping a few photos. The sun is starting to set. We got another storm cloud kind of bearing in on us. I think we went through two or three sets of just pouring down rain while we had this fish on for six hours. But... It's nice to get a few photos when you're out on the water with her. So we're wrapping that up and getting ready to head for the barn. Okay, we went 14 miles with the swordfish right on the top left corner since we hooked it. We hooked it out in like 1,500 feet of water. We're in 953 right now. 14 miles. Got a beautiful sunset. We're gonna we're gonna bonsai her back here to the to the barn and there will be a little celebration going on later. She's big, big boy. It's a big fish. Oh, wait a minute. Go here. Got the fin in. You alright? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're doing the lower jaw tape measurement right now. But 79 and a half. 79 and a half, 79 and three quarters. Go end to end, see how long he is. We're 120, 128, right on the money. I know it loses that 20. No, I had that off of there. 220. 220? Yep. Let's do the, um, okay. I would. How do we get it down? That's how you get it done. Okay. Okay. <laughs> a lot of you have asked, what do I use for bait for the swordfish? So today I'm going to go over some of the tools you need when rigging bait. First thing, you need a little rigging floss and a needle. The needle I've got is not a mortician's needle. So the needle I've got is not a mortician's needle. It's a standard needle. The mortician's needles on the end of them, they're sharp and they have a beveled edge. The standard needle does not. You do not want to use a mortician's needle because we're grabbing the needle, pulling it through the bait, and sooner or later your hand's going to slip up that needle. And if this end has got an inch of sharp stuff, it's going to slice you right up. A pair of crimpers. For the leaders, I'm using 300 pound line. I've had, I've already had these two rigged once. If I catch a sword on them, I do not reuse them. If I don't catch one, I'll reuse them a couple times. 300 pound crimps. Ice pick comes in handy for starting and punching the holes into your bait. A pair of scissors, I use them all the time. Sharp knife. This knife I use specifically for rigging bait and stuff. A hook file. A couple of squid stir skirts. I'm going to rig a couple different baits today. Your choice of a 10-0 or 11-0 hook. On these baits, I'm probably going to use a 10-0 and a bait of choice. When I catch bait, 
I like to take my bait, I get it pre-trimmed out, vac pack it, and I've got a stock in my freezer in the bait shop. But once you once I get my bait, I take I've got a salt baking soda brine mix I dust it with. Those are kind of the utensils and tools we need to make some bait. First thing you do when you guys catch some fish, a bonita or something you want to use for bait, you're gonna kind of, I, I use the belly and I use strips. So today I'm gonna to show you how to do a strip. With the bait, you can see, you can see it's layered here. The skin's kind of, or the meat's layered one on top of the other. Actually the layer, this is typically, this is the front of the fish. But when we make the bait, we want it to be the back of the bait. We don't want the water coming in, hitting and going underneath the layers of meat. So this is the towards the tail of the fish, but this will be the front of our bait. I'll trim the bait down. I'll, I'll bevel the side edges here off of it at a kind of an angle. And this one is ready to go. First thing is decide what size hook you want to use. This is a little smaller bait. I'm going to use a 10-0 hook. When I do my baits, I like to lay the hook down inside the, the bait, we'll call it maybe like an inch or so on this guy. So I'm gonna run the, the beginning of the hook right right down about an inch inside the bait. This is where I like to use the ice pick because the skin on your baits is typically really tough. I'm like just having a hard time even getting into this thing right now. So you take your ice pick, poke a hole in it. That way you can that way you can get your line through there. Next, I'm going to take and lay the hook out on the side. And kind of where the hook starts to curl out here is where it needs to come out the bait. Some guys are really good at, at estimating that exactly. I'm not, but I know it's got to come out right about here. I'm just going to do a little slit about a half inch with my knife where that hook comes out. So once you've got either a hole or a slit for your hook, my manatee's playing under my dock here. But the, um, you just line your hook up. That's where it's going to go into the bait. The first thing I'm going to do is attach the hook to the bait. So you take your 300-pound line. Again, I've got this guy wrapped up here. Got a mess going on here. That happens. How long will it take Captain Matt to unwrap the mess? That's the next question. The next step is running the line through the through the hook and then through the hole you made with your ice pick into the bait. It was being a little difficult this morning. So I like to take that, get your bait kind of lined up on the hook, slide it down. You're going to snug, the, snug it up. You can see where I've got it, just a little snugged up on the bait right on on the hook here. You don't want it too loose. I like it just tightened up just a little bit on it. Get her back down there. So kind of like that, just where it puts a little bit of pressure on the bait. Again, then I'm gonna crimp that next. If you're not used to using crimping tools, they're very easy. The crimper shows what size crimps to use for what slot. I'm using the 2.2 on the bottom right now. It's a, it's a 300 pound crimp. The crimps are pretty wide. I always put the crimper on the side of something and press down. Then you get guaranteed consistency on the crimp. Very important on your crimps too. You do not want to crimp the crimp on the end of it. You want it in a little bit. In a bigger crimp like this, I put two crimps on it. After you have your bait crimped on, I'm going to cut off the excess model. So the next step here is you want the bait to stay on the hook when the swordfish is beating the tar out of it with his sword. So I'm going to throw a couple stitches on there and essentially I'm going to wrap a stitch here and another one down here just to hold that, lock that bait in place on that hook. You're going to leave a tag in three four inches on it just so you can tie it off i like to wrap it around a couple three times on each stitch get that guy back out here a little bit you 
then you can see how tough the skin is on the bait that's why I do not use mortician's needles originally I started using those do not like it so I'm gonna do a couple a couple overhands here just to snug it down you don't want to put a lot of pressure on it you just want enough just to tie it off right there we're gonna cut the tail end off of her Gonna do another stitch farther down again I like to cut a little slot here with the hook just to get it where I want it so I'll go about halfway down before the start of the before the start of the bend of the hook I'm up about a half an inch or so from that there we got a nice little knot we've got two stitches holding the hook to the bait right now So that's what she kind of looks like. There's two stitches on it, holding it to the bait. Next step is to pick whatever you would like for a squid skirt over the top. Color, I don't know if the color actually matters to the swordfish. I keep asking them, they won't tell me. So on this one, I'm gonna put, this one's a glow skirt. When I'm sizing the hooks, if I'm using like a, a mahi belly or a skipjack or panita belly on there, when I'm sizing the hooks, the skirt, the size of the head of the skirt is based off the size of the bait I'm using. So these are, I would call, I think they're a nine inch skirt. Every tackle shop carries, carries them. So next thing, you slide your skirt down over your bait. Now, as you're as you're going along and the bait's going through the water it's going to float like this the hook is going to be down that's got the weight on it so i i don't know if it matters or not but i always turn the eyes sideways so they're looking out to the side that's how things look underwater that's natural i'm a dive master i've done a lot of diving i've never seen a fish swimming with his eyes on top of his head other than a halibut so once we get the squid skirt on there, and here's something important too with the squid skirts. When you have a multicolored skirt, fish in the ocean, their bottom side is lighter color than their, than their top side. It's always darker. So if I was going to put the purple and black on here, this is the way the skirt would be. The hook would be coming out the bottom here because the bottom of the skirt is the lighter color here. So when I'm stitching my baits, that's how I like to like to do that I don't know if it matters but when you're looking at fish in the water their bottom sides always the lighter color so once you have the skirt on here I'm just gonna feel in here for the tip the tip of the hook and I've got it right here I'm gonna push this guy through there I can get him through there it's not behaving So I'm going to push him through the skirt, through the eye of the hook as well. Again, that's why I don't like the mortician's needles, because the ends of them have a sharp edge for about an inch. And this thing is slippery. You're pulling it through the bait. You could easily slip and cut yourself on it. So I'm going to go through here a couple, three times. And this is just holding the skirt on the bait. Again, you're preparing your bait to have the swordfish come in and attack it they don't come up and just eat the bait they actually come in and slash the bait and then they grab it and eat it there's been many times I've had a swordfish hit a bait a couple times over 50 times they just for whatever reason they're not hungry or just beating the tar out of it before they eat it so again once you get your bait on there tie a couple loops overhand and I'm going to do a double here or your skirt on there rather and there that squid skirt is tied on you can do another set on the other side if you want but she's on there pretty firm right now so that is a made-up bait right there looks like something a swordfish will eat one thing I do once in a while too when I'm out there if I'm pulling my bait sometimes I'll take the scissors and I'll split the bait down the middle here so it flutters like a squid 
So that's something you can do to give a little more action. But typically, you know, most of the time when I clean a swordfish, I always check their stomachs. This is about the average size of the baits, right? You know, 9 to 12 inches that they're eating down here. Sometimes they've got smaller stuff in them. Sometimes they got bigger stuff. But this is kind of about the average size bait. So I kind of like to match the hatch, so to speak. Again, if you guys have any questions on rigging bait, I can do another one. Here, I'll show you a belly. So here I've got a, ma a mahi belly I've sewn up. Again, it's a little... The bait's a little bigger profile, a little thicker because it's just wider. You can see where the hook comes out. I used an 11-0 on that, a little, little bigger squid skirt. So when you're stitching a belly, it takes a little longer. You do two stitches on the hook again, and then I sew the bait from, from the top down, to, down halfway through the bait and back up. I keep the, you see the stitches are about, you know, three quarters of an inch apart. You go down one direction, go through it a couple times, come back the other direction so you're cross hatching over on the bait just to keep it held together when it starts getting attacked by the swordfish. So two styles of bait that I kind of use. I mean, every guy I know that fishes swordfish, I swear we all do it different and they all seem to work. So if you guys have a favorite method that you like using, please give me a shout out, shoot me a picture and I'll include it in one of my upcoming videos. So I'm loading the video up here. I'm doing, just grinding through all the footage. And there's a lot of it. When you have a six hour battle going on, there's a lot of footage. So this is my favorite part. You got my buddy Art. He's a neighborhood legend. He's holding on to the sword. He's taller than he is, you guys. And I'm just snapping some photos. The sun's already went down. We're we're probably 28 miles from Marathon at this point. Big thumbs up to Art. Happy birthday, my brother. Love you to death, man. Captain Matt here going to sign off. Please hit that subscribe button. If you're not already, give me a smash on the like button. Shoot me a comment, you guys. If you have any questions, anything about sword fishing or any other fishing, go ahead, shoot me a question here. I will answer all of them. I check my comments every day. And again, you guys, thanks for tuning in. Be safe out there and tight lines.